All righty. So it looks like we are live and ready to go. Um, welcome everyone to this round table on teaching the global war on terror challenges and practices. Um, I first want to say that this roundtable came out of a collaboration with Mesa's Committee on Undergraduate Middle East Studies. So I want to thank Victoria Hightower for spearheading this collaboration and then everyone else for joining on the project. Um, so this roundtable builds from a very dynamic and fruitful conversation, many of which our panelists today were part of. Um, and we're hoping to continue discussion at, on the stakes of teaching the global war on terror, the intellectual work that goes into teaching this the ways in which our institutions are deeply imbricated into the global war on terror and what that means for our classrooms and how we approach our classrooms. Um, I'm honored to be moderating this panel of scholars. We're joined by Yusuf Beckett, an associate professor of international studies at California State University, Long Beach, Madam Durrani, a professorial lecturer at American University, Sarah Gabriel, an associate professor of history at Concordia University, and Jay Shalat, an assistant professor of English at Eurisness College. Unfortunately, Farouz Unrola and Bassam Haddad could not join us today, but Bassam has sent us some video remarks to kind of kick us off. Um, so we're going to start right off the bat with this, the opening remarks, and then go on to a larger discussion. Um, so we're going to begin first with Bassam's, and I'll just share those. Sorry, there seems to be some uh, tech issues. So I'm going to retry that. Ap apologies for that. Um, So it actually looks like I'm having some issues with sharing screen. So we're going, unfortunately, I'm going to have to skip Bassem's remarks because the Zoom is not letting me share any of my audio at the moment. Um, so unfortunately, we'll move on to our first speaker. So Yusuf, do you want to go ahead right now? Apologies for these tech issues. Sure. Um, so first, I want to thank my my I'm a latecomer to the conversation so I really appreciate um being in this space with all of you and to, for organizing this uh I think what is really important and timely conversation given the context of what's happening in uh the Israeli genocidal attack on Gaza I think there's a lot of connections to what happened with the global war on terror so I think this is quite a timely conversation so the 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 question that you asked uh for us to start with was about kind of how does the ever expanding securitization of the space uh of of the university uh, uh what does that mean for our classroom and how does that reality shape um the way we frame and theorize the global war on terror and so it made me think about, for me, the way I frame, the way that I understand, and honestly, the way that I'm, that I feel in the world, is of two worlds that are constantly existing on top of each other and in competition with each other. And for me, these two worlds, there is the world as it actually is, the world of that that Iraqis live in, the world that Afghans live in, the world that Palestinians live in. And then there is the other world, the world that is purported to be, the world as it is perceived by those in the hallways of power in Washington, D.C., the world that Pentagon says exists, the world of the White House and of Number 10 Downing Street. Both worlds are supposedly talking about the same place, but one actually exists and the other one is a fantasy. The other one is a fantasy concocted by power, acted upon by power, 
and a view that serves the interests of power alone. The world that is perceived by American elites of places like Iraq, Afghanistan, or Palestine is not about those places for me, but rather uh, what those spaces need to be perceived like in order for the American elite to tell the story about themselves, about who they are. So that Iraq and Afghanistan need to be savage so that the American elite could be civilized. Uh, Afghans need to be misogynists so American elite could be emancipatory. Iraq must be corrupt and sectarian for American elites to be honest and universalists. Afghans must be irrational and emotional for American elite to be rational and careful assessors of truth. The view of the concocted world for me is one of categories and ideal types. Categories here can be nation states, or it could be racialized groups like Muslims versus us, or it could be geographies like the West and the East. They are ontological, the essence of who we are as opposed to who they are. They are spatial of over here as opposed to over there. The Bush administration would always talk about we need to fight them over there so we don't have to fight them over here. Uh, these categories are also temporal, the contemporary period as opposed to the history or the past. The past is so far past that it has no bearing today on today. These are distinct categories in this view of this concocted world. These categories are said to be distinct. They are said to be different. So what happens in one place, let's say in one state, is independent of what happens in the other state. And moreover, there is so much distance between these two distinct categories that there is hardly a linkage between the two. So that the past is far from the present. 2001 is so far from 2024. Iraq is so far from the U.S. distance-wise, but also in terms of advancement, enlightenment, and its path towards modernity. So that we are ontologically, spatially, and temporally so different than them, which can then allow us to disavow and deflect from our actions in creating the conditions for them. And then the conditions for them then is the fault of them only. And, uh, and, and also the very reason for why we have to do onto them what we must do. So that even if we commit genocide, it is the, their fault that they are forcing us to commit the genocide. And thus our evils are actually a reflection and rooted in them as opposed to us. This for me is like a bordered logic uh, that has a long history in liberal thinking. It is a racialized logic. It is also the logic of the nation state. It is also the logic of many disciplines that we exist in. Key amongst them is political science, international relations, and major parts of sociology, which is the discipline that I come from. Ideal types, the Vibarian approach to the world. I think today, as has been the case before, we must insist on actually talking about the world as it actually exists. And we must insist then on our analysis to be dialectical and relational, as opposed to be governed by difference, distinction, distance, and disavowal, what I call the four Ds of racialized thinking. So how does the creation, so we must ask, and we must ask our students, and this is something that I try to at least struggle to do in my classes, how does the creation of over here in its present form produced over there, and in the process of producing over there, reproduce the very conditions of over here. So that the, what the U.S. does in Iraq is a function of what's happening in the U.S., and in it, in it, in it, and it and in it doing what it did in Iraq, then reproduce the conditions in the U.S. itself. So this over here and over there can be the U.S. and Iraq, or it could be Israel and Palestine, or even within the United States. It could be seen in the obscenely wealthy parts of the U.S. living next to tragically impoverished part of the United States, because those categories exist here in the U.S. as well, in terms of how the elites talk about what's the conditions on the ground. A relational approach then necessarily means that we have to tackle Western, liberal, you know, Zionist Amer and American disavowal of their actions. It becomes about showing how the real actually existing world. So uh, to show that so as to make liars of those who insist on the concocted world that is purported to be. And I think that is for me, I see that as part of my role as the teacher is to put the kind of a mirror back 
that all of these things that you think about over there is actually a projection of the anxieties and discontinuities and tensions of over here. This process then means taking on the essential lies and unjust machinery that reproduces the American state, which then means that our classroom at once become for a moment, at least for me, an emancipated space with a liberatory political imaginary, at least we aspire for that to be the case, while also at the same time becoming an embattled space that is increasingly scrutinized but overlooked, paid attention to but resource starved, surveilled and policed. I'm honestly, and 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 for me, I pose this 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 kind of um two two things that happen at the same time, and I'm not sure there is kind of a a way out of that. So uh, that is kind of my uh, a reflection in terms of of the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a, a great foot to start us off with. Next, we'll move on to Mariam. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Makaram, and thank you, everyone. Thank you to Sarah for originally organizing us at the roundtable. And uh, thank you for, uh, you know, continuing the conversation today, everyone. I, I'm really appreciative. And thank you very much to the audience. Um, so I want to talk about um, how our scholarly work informs the pedagogical work, right? And like kind of thinking through um, some of these connections. And I'm gonna talk about my approach to teaching about the war on terror, which is that I try to approach it based on or drawing on uh, Patrick Wolf's formulation of thinking about settler colonialism as structure and not an event. And what this allows us to see, of course, are the connections and continuities that are happening between war on terror policies and actions, and relatedly the responses and resistance movements that are happening across contexts. And this is where um, I want to talk a little bit about my research, my current book project, and make some of these connections. So my project um, looks at how the war on terror is impacting higher education in the U.S. and in Pakistan. And I'm incorporating uh, an interdisciplinary decolonial feminist analysis, which means that I'm drawing on primarily how students have experienced this system and then kind of reflecting on the policies and connections after the fact, which I think does some important work of prioritizing how people experience this uh, structure. Um, so this is based on ethnographic field work in Lahore and New York City and online with these students from 2013 to 2019. And the two groups that I worked with in the US um, and in Pakistan. So in the U.S., it was primarily Pakistani diaspora Muslim students at a public college. And then in Pakistan, it was primarily Pashtun and other ethnic minority Muslim scholarship students at a private university in Lahore. And what this work shows is that even though college campuses are typically from are far from the typically imagined uh, theaters of war, U.S. empire actually targets educational programs and policies in order to surveil, monitor and manage racialized students in both settings. So in New York City, this can look like Muslim students learning that their mobility and continued success necessitates performances of the good Muslim student subject to professors, peers, and any other authority figures that they encounter both on and off campus. And at the same time, the NYPD surveillance operations are targeting Muslim student groups and their mosques and their communities across the city. So both are happening at the same time. And in Pakistan, this appears as both the targeted uh, drone bombing of places deemed to be kind of, uh, you know, home to terrorist uh, cells that includes indiscriminately killing students as we're seeing the scholasticide that's happening in Gaza and the targeting of so many young people and children before they're even going to school. Um, and at the same time, we also see in Pakistan targeted educational opportunities for programs that are funded by the U.S. State Department that require similar performances of the good ethnic minority. And so from this approach, we can what I'm doing is I'm tracking these co-constitutive processes of imperial racialization. And what I uh, have done to kind of see these in the same social field is to kind of come up with the, uh, the imperial optic, which is a way of conceptually framing these as parallel sets of encounters that are shaped by imperial racialization. 
And this approach allows us to see how U.S. empire, vis-a-vis -vis these localized war policies, is exploiting pre-existing systems of racialized difference or ethnic difference in service of U.S. empire and building on an inherited process of racialization informed by British colonialism in the context of Pakistan. And how does this kind of figure into pedagogical approaches, right? What this, I think, for me does is that um, it allows me to kind of think of all of these uh, systemic forms of violence that we're observing and studying and see the connections across contexts, especially with regards to the war on terror. And um, I'm thinking right now of uh, um, the work by Nikhil Paul Singh about the inner and outer wars as another kind of analytic frame. And what I hope to do in classes when I'm teaching about the war on terror is to help students understand and develop their own analytics that allow them to see these uh, you know, uh, co-occurring uh, events as related rather than completely kind of separated. And these separations kind of going off of Yusuf's comments are based on this idea of categorical difference between the here and the there, between domestic and foreign. And so in, in the work that I'm, I'm writing and I'm, I'm kind of drawing on so many other scholars who are doing similar work that shows how, um, you know, for example, with racial capitalism, that there is this global structure that we're all kind of within, kind of shaped by, but it manifests in different contexts in very different ways. And so um, I'm going to stop there. And uh, I look forward to kind of continuing to make the connections across our comments. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks. Already I'm seeing so many connections within your your comments. I'm, I look forward to digging deeper into them in, in the discussion portion. Um, Sada? Hi, everybody. Uh, so just to start, can you hear me? Good. Okay. Just to start off, um, just want to echo, you know, thanks again to everybody, you know, for participating in this, to Makaram for organizing it, um, and Mesby and, um, and to Dalia and, uh, you know, sponsorship from Cumas. Uh, I'm really delighted to continue this conversation with you. It's um, uh, <laughs> only getting more you know, urgent, uh, unfortunately. So I'll say a couple words about my own research and teaching as well. Uh, really briefly, um, uh, you know, my work in, in and outside the classroom really centers on questions of race, settler colonialism, with a particular focus uh, actually on uh, the Maghreb and France, um, the modern history of Islam in the West, uh, law, uh, whether state law, non-state law, international law, uh, and critical border studies. And I've taught courses on just about all of these things, you know, in the kind of titles, but um, I'm really going to be drawing for my, you know, thinking, you know, for the purpose of this roundtable on a course that I started teaching uh, called a, a Global History September 11th, 2001. So I proposed this course about three years ago in my department as we were approaching the 20 year anniversary of 9-11 and as we were witnessing the chaotic US withdrawal from Afghanistan. Um, and uh, so yeah, I came up basically with this uh, first year seminar uh, history course. This class had the twin goals of demystifying 9-11 and the war on terror, and in that process, teaching students how to become historians in their daily critical engagements with the world. In terms of classroom practice, um, uh, you know, as I said, this is what's really going to be kind of grounding my remarks, but obviously uh, in the context of, uh, you know, contemporary situations that um, Yusuf and Maryam have already really thoughtfully started to, you know, to draw out. So I want us to add, you know, the title of this round table, it's we've sort of parsed it out into challenges and practices, although obviously these two things are, are not <laughs> parsable, but, uh, you know, for what I want to say today, I kind of thought I was to kick off, start with challenges, um, which we've somewhat conceptualized as like outside of the classroom before turning to practices uh, inside. So of course by challenges, we mean escalated assaults on academic freedom, which in the structure of the global war on terror operates in racist and especially Islamophobic uh, grammars. As a result, even though we are subjects or teachers of the global war on terror, many of us uh, are at the same time objects uh, and targets of it, of course. 
Mostly these pressures are felt in terms of increasingly panoptic and punitive campus climates. And until very recently, we've mainly contended with non-state apparatuses of suppression from interventions by donors and trustees to vigilante style informant groups of the kind of canary mission variety. But we're also starting to see even coercive state violence brought to bear, right? So just two weeks ago at York University uh, here in Toronto, uh, I should say, you know, in Canada, which is where I am currently, uh, when police uh, burst into a classroom of 20 students who are doing nothing more threatening than listening attentively to a guest lecture about Palestine. Um, so I have to confess uh, that when I think about academic freedom and the global war on terror, I typically, you know, use language that portrays the university as a sort of field or a terrain in the global war on terror. Um, and Mariam and I, you know, have been working on a piece where, you know, I, that's the kind of uh, the language uh, that we use. Um, so the university is in this frame a kind of passive site of struggle, right, between competing actors. But it's equally important um, and maybe more important to also bear in mind how universities actively participate in the global war on terror. And it's largely thanks to actually conversations with students, uh, both in and outside of classroom you know, settings, context, that I've been thinking more about this. Uh, so students sharing you know, their concerns, uh, and research that they've done, whether, uh, you know, again, for classes or otherwise, you know, for campus advocacy, for example. So no small part of the erosion of academic freedom has to do with increasing investment of Western universities in the global war on terror's militarization of large swaths of the planet, not less than uh, 85 countries uh, around the world and counting over the past 20 years. Some examples of this include things like the expansion of so-called hard science programs through the proliferation of industry partnerships and high private donations. And this hollowing out of universities into technocratic credentialing bodies is typically framed as neoliberalism at work. And of course it is, uh, but this process also serves various pipelines from STEM disciplines into weapons, military logistics and intelligence tech industries. And this is to say nothing of course of the investments of university endowments and pension funds uh, and otherwise uh, in the order of billions upon billions of dollars in militarization and occupation industries and technologies. Okay, so zooming in a little bit more as I sort of promised uh, to practices. Uh, when I first offered my first year seminar uh, on 9-11 and the global war on terror, it was not necessarily given and actually sometimes it took some, you know, uh, effort, you know, it was a, a really a pedagogical uh, objective in a lot of ways to show students how the global war on terror was still relevant to them. With some exceptions, uh, students whose communities weren't directly affected um, tend to have little sense of depth and social of the social and political transformations wrought by the expansion of the war on terror after September 11th. For these students, mostly born after 9-11, the global war on terror was uh, a matter of uh, prosthetic memory. They were among the first generation of people to see September 11th and the war on terror as history and therefore somehow naturalized and inevitable. Now I'm not teaching this class right now. I mean, I'm actually on parental leave, so I'm not currently teaching. And so I'm, I'm actually very eager to hear more uh, from my uh, you know, fellow roundtable participants about this. But I will say that the next time I teach this class and it's scheduled for next year, I don't expect that I will have this particular challenge, right? By next year, I expect that many of the immediate post 9-11 cultural and political shifts that we read about and discuss in class will actually have resonances, uh, deep resonances uh, for them, even if some might still be looking for the language and resources to parse out exactly how and why. And I expect there'll be some degree of curiosity about the parallels and pathways between that historical juncture and the one we're living in now. And I have to confess, I don't yet know how exactly I'll be addressing that. Uh, and as I said, I'd love to hear from others here about how they have been um, or how they're planning on doing this, right, in practice. But it has made me revisit my prior attempts to incorporate historical methods and tools into my teaching praxis, especially the concepts of historicity um, and periodization. So I know that doesn't sound very sexy, but periodization has a politics, right? It's not neutral. 
And so something I try to get my students to think critically about is uh, the historicity that is the sense of oneself, right, in, in time as a historical subject that the global war on terror interpolates them into. So we try to get at that by asking things like, uh, what does it mean that September 11th gets presented as unexpected, out of the blue, right? Sui generis, uh, this total break, this rupture from what came before. Why is 9-11 uh, anti-historical uh, and what are the implications of this? And I'm especially thinking about you know, um, Anne McClintock's essay on imperial ghosting and what she describes as, 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 in her words, a growing repudiation across broad political spectrum the broad political spectrum of the idea of history itself. Uh, and again, you know, there's a slew of kind of quotes that, that kind of back this up. Richard Pearl proclaiming that the world began on 9-11. There is no intellectual history or even, you know, Bush too you know, saying things like the past. I think we agree the past is over. So in turn, why is it pedagogically and politically consequential when we teach students to contextualize, to de-exceptionalize and demystify 9-11. Um, and something I have learned for teaching this class is that there's an ideological interest in taking 9-11 or events like it out of time, out of history, right? To maintain a recursive reaction of shock and anxiety. For the war on terror to persist, it must be in a sense forgotten. Its activation depends on amnesia. The global war on terror's affects of the unexpected and with them perpetual vulnerability must be ironically reliable and renewable. Uh, so from there, something I'm interested in doing uh, more of now is incorporating what I'm starting to think of as resistant temporalities uh, into my teaching, into the classroom. But uh, that's where I'll stop for now and welcome ideas from, um, from the audience and from fellow panelists. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And last but not least, Jay. Hi, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'll jump right in. At Mesa, I talked about how I taught two courses on the war and terror, one on 9-11 in the novel class, and then, and that was for upper level um, English majors and then an intro war and terror lit course. Um, since then, I've been teaching a senior seminar um, about the war on terror, and we look at the relationality between domestic and foreign and how the past congeals with the present. So I'm immediately like, as soon as y'all started talking, I was like, oh shit, everything is so related to my topic. Like the, the class, I wish I, I, I wish I sent the link to my students, but um, oh well, there it'll be available on YouTube. Um, so one of the big takeaways that I've had so far teaching this class is that students are profoundly interested in the historical and geopolitical underpinnings about the war on terror. More than understanding literary methods and techniques, they're namely curious about the, how things came to be the way they are. To put it simply, they're interested more in the history than they are the fiction. Truth isn't just stranger than fiction, it's also more compelling. I've structured the course around some keywords about the war on terror. Um, so like if we meet once a week, so I do every day has like a keyword or buzzword or whatever, just to keep things kind of contained and like easy for me to organize. Um, so some of the um, keywords are terror and terrorism, uh, hypersecurity and policing, Guantanamo Bay uh, is, and Islamophobia. Next week is Palestine. Um, so students read about how racialization, post-coloniality, feminism and other theories help us understand the consequences and ideological underpinnings of forever war. Because it is a literature course, uh, I oftentimes forget I'm a lit professor. Uh, I also supplement these readings and keywords with texts of various genres to expose them to the variegated aesthetic responses to the, the, the war and terror catalyzes. Taking this slow, almost piecemeal approach in, um, excuse me, this almost piecemeal approach demonstrates how the war and terror is a kind of matrix, a process that is combined of numerous different phenomena. It exposes the relationality between borders and history, how the past bleeds into the present, and how much of what we call the war on terror is not new. Student questions have also reflected this. Many express an understanding about the war on terror less as a periodizing event and more as an organizing structure. This desire to learn about empire's reach and extent over centuries comes from a structural whitewashing that frames not only K through 12 curricula, but also college education as well. 
At Mesa, we talked quite a bit about the way war and terror securitization informs our classrooms. And I want to suggest that American or global North, however we want to frame it, exceptionalism is one of those ways like that finds its way into the is, is an organizing principle, I guess, of of our education system. Not only are students and parents and other faculty reporting our work for being anti-American, but they've all been taught to do so by a post 9-11 culture of suspicion and hypersecurity. Just as the war organizes geopolitics and culture, it also shapes how and what students are taught. I teach at a private liberal arts college with a majority of uh, with a majority white student population. In this war and terror class that I'm teaching now, again, all graduating seniors, I'm the only person of color in the whole room. Um, and it's like, it was alarming because the other day I said that and one of my students looked around like, huh, you are. I was like, yeah, thank you for recognizing your whiteness <laughs> all of a sudden. Um, <laughs> So these racial dynamics participate in furthering a narrative of history that is not only incorrect, but is one that is complicit in expanding empire. That might seem like an exaggeration, but I think when we consider how education aids and abets imperial aims, it helps us see how embedded racialized perceptions about history actually are. Look at Colombia, for example, I have a list of things that I'm just gonna go through real quick. Look at Colombia, which is actively suppressing and doxing student voices or how a teacher in my home state of Georgia said he would slit his student's throat if she objected to the Israeli flag in his classroom. Or for the sake of another example, how the Department of Defense's 1033 program, in that kind of program, law enforcement in a school district or higher ed institution can buy excess military equipment. Um, that's why Ohio State has a tank. Um, I didn't know that until I was reading about it the other day and I was like, well, like imagine having a, just like rolling up to class and seeing a tank, right? The war on terror. So like it just, it's everywhere. To divorce such arms trading and other manifestations of the war on terror from race is detrimental. I can't help but ask myself, what position does that put me in as a Brown scholar, a Brown teacher? What does it put, how, where does it put my students, the marginalized non-white ones? Um, these are the concerns that seep into our classrooms every day, manifestations of war and terror culture in pedagogical spaces. As non-white scholars of the war and terror of the contemporary world, we are forced to negotiate these tensions in ways our colleagues quite simply are not. And war and terror logics construct the administrative oversight of education as well. Beyond the classroom and in dean's offices or on online reviews, educators are reprimanded for teaching material that might be seen as an affront to the nation or to the sentiments uh, that students have been forced to learn. Student evals are the forefront of this policing and securitizing. It goes without saying that BIPOC, queer, and women scholars received the most backlash. These conditions mapped against larger global conflicts that overshadow everything have emboldened me. I, uh, I care less about the consequences of a, that a shitty teaching eval might reap and instead, I'm more concerned about the potentials laden in teaching these courses and within the space itself, right? As a scholar whose anti-colonial pedagogy and ethos has the potential to change minds, carve safe spaces, and change the narrative, I'm, a I'm able to resist and revise misunderstandings and misconceptions. And in, in turn, I hope I can participate in crafting a, a world free of imperial borders, logics, and violence. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate the time and care that you've given to these remarks and they speak so well to each other. Um, so I have a few questions prepared and for folks on YouTube, please feel free to drop your questions in the chat and I'll be monitoring them and bringing them up to the panel. Um, I think the one of the great through lines that I felt through all of these remarks was the significance of the the weaving together the continuities that we bring to our students as we are approaching this conversation Yusuf you you term this in terms of a mirror um, and I'm wondering if you all can maybe speak to what have been the strongest mirrors and continuities that your students have responded to and how have you built upon that as you approach um, teaching these topics um, and kind of recognizing the relations of both us as individuals, as subjects, but also the institutions in which we exist and navigate through. Um, I'm gonna kind of open this up to anyone who wants to respond and draw, draw upon. 
I mean, just because I taught it last week, we were talking about Guantanamo Bay and my students, one of the things that's like, I always have to remind myself whenever I teach these classes is like, my students were born well after 9-11. Um, and so they are just familiar with the war on terror as a as a phenomenon that they, they just basically take it for a given, as I think Sarah was talking about in her paper. And Guantanamo Bay and was the big thing that really kind of solidified for my students in class. Like it was, I was watching them figure it out in real time. The, like the extent of violence that America imparts onto Muslim bodies in particular. So we were reading um, poems from Guantanamo, uh, the fantastic collection. And my students were a struck by the level of violence that was rooted in um the censoring of the poems and like the the long introductions were discussing all that censoring but also of the hope laden in each of those poems if you read the collection every single poem is is very hopeful the tone is very hopeful and so they were they were struck by that kind of contestation between this like governmental oversight and like the resistance through hope and poetry that the poets were writing in um and so like that mirror they were just kind of shocked and taken aback by like the way something so simple as um uh what is the barney song i the the barney theme song was weaponized and like blasted in the jail um in jail cells so they were just kind of taken aback by the way art in particular can be weaponized but at the same time how art can be used as a very significant method of resistance and one last thing is like i talked about how very recent until like maybe last year a lot of the art done in Guantanamo Bay, like the paintings that the prisoners did, the detainees did, they were not allowed outside of the government. Like the government said, you can't bring this out of the world, like out into the world. And there are many court cases right now about like, I deserve a right to my art. Um, so showing that contestation has been really uh, illuminating and that mirror about the uh, for my students was really uh, clarifying in a lot of ways. Yeah, I think I'm going to also jump in, sorry, because um, I was also thinking um, as Jay was talking about my class last week and what we covered, because I think, again, there's like some there there is a way to kind of, I think, pedagogically make sure that the continuities are 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 um, are being amplified um, for student kind of like uh, understandings. Right. And so. Um, so I, I, I teach in a school of IR. Um, my backdrop is like the atrium of the building. <laughs> um, and uh, I teach intercultural and international communication courses. And so in my undergraduate intercultural communication course, um, you know, this course is, I think, it might have been conceived at some point to kind of um, help students become more diplomatic in how they talk about difference, right? Um, and so I, I, I hold that kind of like, uh, again, like uh, kind of this is one perspective or one way of kind of thinking about what this course is. And I think what I try to do is kind of question the entire um, notion of intercultural, like where did this come from? You know, and, and my background is I'm a linguistic anthropologist and an education studies scholar. So again, like questioning these kind of like taken for granted, uh, you know, um, educational frames is, is, is definitely something I've tried to build into the course. And so this semester, because of actually last semester, um, I have an assignment where students pick up news stories and they analyze them. Um, so they summarize them and they kind of use some course concepts to analyze them and, and share back with the class. And last semester, I did not have a week where we focused on media framing. And so, you know, uh, as we were talking about the news, there was um, a little bit of a, a gap in terms of uh, shared vocabulary to kind of looking at the news and, and talking about it. And so I've uh, added this week, this this semester called uh, a week on media framing. And so for last week, we read about um, the representation of Ukrainian refugees and Yemeni refugees in the U.S. media. We read a study uh, done actually by a colleague um, at AU. We we watched um, Sana Saeed's uh, coverage of the kind of representation of Palestine and Israel. Um, and we also read another piece that focused on um, Cold War kind of representations and then also talking about uh, Bush one and how he talked about the war. Um, so again, like trying to, to make sure that these continuities are really 
come to the fore for students and they're kind of able to pick up on them. And so I think I'm, I, I also have this kind of uh, assignment where at the end of class, they send in something that they're interested in. And so many of the students have actually responded to questions of how do we talk about this propaganda that we're kind of constantly um, immersed in? And like, how do we actually start to separate it out? Because there were these many examples. And so I think, you know, building that, uh, pedagogical, those moments in, in class where they're able to kind of like really see the continuities such that in subsequent weeks, even when we maybe don't have multiple examples to draw on, they understand analytically to not exceptionalize, to not kind of make these kind of uh, take these approaches and they kind of build that as a practice, as an analytical practice that they're looking for what is missing in this conversation um, and always knowing that something is missing. Like that's that's kind of like inherent to communication. Um, but when we're getting information from, you know, corporate media, what is missing is actually very significant. Um, there's there's a lot of weight that's attached to that. So so that I mean I really appreciate Jay kind of drawing on class because I was like I have something to say right away about this. Great. So I think you had something you wanted to pop in. Well, again, you know, as I said, I'm not teaching this semester, so I almost wanted to just say, oh, please tell me, you know. <laughs> I just, I'm, uh, you know, like McCarrick, like I just, uh, I'm equally eager to hear, you know, what's, what's been working, uh, what you've been doing this semester. Have you changed anything, you know, that uh, it, in the way that you're teaching classes this semester, let's say compared to like previous, uh, you know, in the past few years um, and what's landing, like what's working? Uh, you know, I mean, my mind went also to, um you know, we also do a lot of material like primary source material, uh, you know, coming out of Guantanamo and the work of detainees and um, some of these really like powerful um, uh, you know, testimonies and uh, interviews and especially memoirs. Um, what's really interesting about memoirs is the way that um, because, again, you know, you have that with the detainees, uh, we in particular we read Mo'azim Beg's uh, memoir. It was a British uh, detainee. Uh, who was just kind of like swept up, you know, like in the rounds, um, uh, and um, uh, and had pre and was a was previously a law student. So what's interesting is he was somebody who had initiated some of these um, suits, like trying to get them, you know, heard in, uh, you know, in federal courts in uh, in like mainland uh, in the U.S. And uh, you know his kind of narration of his own life that, you know, I try again. I, I'm always looking for better ways, uh, you know, to do this, um, especially ways that speak to the students, you know, kind of like meet them where they are. But it really exceeds what I, you know, was trying to describe earlier of this like temporality of the war on terror, because, uh, you know, instead he's actually, you know, he, he's narrating his life uh, in terms of, you know, much longer kind of imperial, um, you know, projects, uh, you know, of the US, of NATO. And, um, uh, and, you know, framing them kind of like, in, you know, in terms, again, of, you know, of his own, uh, you know, subjectivity, you know, as it's forming in response to these things. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you know, in thinking about whether I would, or I, I certainly would use that material, but I'm, again, thinking, you know, through this conversation about how to build in those continuities that you're all talking about, um, you know, is the challenge. <laughs> Right now. So in, in hearing you all talk, so I, I, I teach in international studies, so it's kind of like an area studies place. And I don't believe in area studies. So part of what I try to do, and I have I have the I'm privileged enough to be in an opposite place as Jay, which is my I, I'm in a state school in Long Beach in California. So my students are predominantly students of color. Uh, they're working class students. And so they already come with, I think there is their lived experience is different than the terminology and the way that people that that they are talked about. And so in some ways, I feel kind of like them, which is that I li live in the world and I look around and I'm like, all you media and politicians and so-called smart people are talking about a world 
that is not the world that I see in front of me. And so I, for me, it's a little bit easier for to communicate to my students because I feel like if I'm able to give them the alternative terminology and provide the alternative kind of uh, story, the narrative of the other history, that it's a lot easier to then for them to break through kind of what they've been, uh, what they see to kind of then tap into their own experience. So part of what I think I'm trying to do is get at that. Um, and so in that sense, I'm, um, I try to connect what happens over there to over here constantly. So in the conversations that I've been having around Palestine, for example, so I teach a class, my Middle East specific class is not so much on the war on terror, but the war on terror is weaved through it. It's called unimagining the Middle East because I, and because, you know, I, um, uh, you have to unimagine the place to begin to imagine it all over again. Uh, and 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 so the conversation I constantly have is connecting what 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 you what you see, whether now is what you see in Gaza or what you were able to see around what was happening in Iraq and Afghanistan to what happened in the case of uh, George Floyd uh, or or all of the countless black folks who were murdered. And that gave rise to kind of the Black Lives Matter movement, which is racial gaslighting, which is like you see something that is happening right in front of you. But the perpetrators of the act tell you, no, 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 it's not it's not happening. What you're seeing actually is not happening. And if you see it and it's happening, it's not that we're doing it. It's that the actual victim is the one that is at fault. And 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 in a way, again, we the victim has to apologize to us for forcing us to act like the victim is, which is violent, uh, savage, outside of civilization itself. Um, and so the, in, in that sense, then, then I think we're able to, for students to be able to see themselves in Iraq, themselves in Afghanistan, and in Palestine, so that to be able to kind of show the the connectivities because i think those connectivities aren't symbolic or metaphorical but actually rooted in the very foundation of the global economy i'm a political economist uh so i like i talk economy and i talk kind of political sociology and it's like look you look at the economy and people are connected uh, look at the economy and it's the same forces acting upon you uh, and then if you look at politics, the same applies. So that structurally, the connection is there. So it's not we're not talking about something that is abstract or conceptual. We're talking about the very structure at its essence. And so that's the 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 kind of the big concepts that I give. But what I found out in my teaching is that what's helped me communicate those structures that could uh, or those concepts that could be a little bit abstract is um like all of you have talked about narratives, prose. Uh, and so I've relied on um, on novels, the two that I've used, but I'm I'm trying to find new ones and and um, add new ones uh, is uh, Omar al Qad's American War. And I like that because if you've said the, seen the novel, it basically makes the the U.S. as having fallen apart and refugee camps and exile and all of the things happening in the U.S. So that just enables you to put yourself in the mind of the other. And the other one that I constantly use is is uh, Sinan Antoun's Corpse Washer when in talking about Iraq. And I and I like that because the protagonist is a young person and as a young person in a religious family, all of that. But then by the end, like you, you connect the, the young person is like any other young person here. And so it breaks the kind of the, the ossified view of what people in, 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 you know, the so-called these other places go through. So, you know, he, he's, he's a little twisted. There's all kinds of sexual tension. There's all kinds of tension with the parents all of this stuff and students are able to tap into that and then I uh, uh, in, in to see to see that so so yeah that that that's kind of so far been my approach it's been for me as someone who doesn't necessarily deal with literature difficult because I have to figure out how do I talk about this but it's it's been extremely helpful because uh it it shows for me it allows me to show how these bigger concepts that I talk about what they look like when they touch down on the ground in the mundane on on an everyday level
this quickly, I also teach uh, Sinan Antunes <laughs> in history classes, right? So, you know, that's the, the same kind of thing. It's like, it doesn't quite like disciplinary, like we have to have a conversation about like, you know, how as historians, you know, like wh uh, what what kind of like, what, you know, why incorporate fiction, you know, into our yeah. materials, you know, as historians. Um, and in a way, you know, that's like a kind of uh, just like a conceit because I just want them to read this book. <laughs> really. Well, he does such um, a good job of weaving yeah. in the history into the narrative that. that exactly. That... Yeah, I absolutely. love that book. It's it does teach really well because students get really into it. Um, I have the opposite. I'm doing the opposite right now, whereas like as a lit professor, I they ask me these history questions. I'm like, oh, God, I got to go back to like what I read this obscure thing. One of my students the other day, we were talking about Guantanamo Bay and he was like, okay, so what is our relationship to Q How did that, like, he said something about Cuba and like how our relationship to Cuba, the United States' relationship to Cuba changed after the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I was like, I don't know. And because, and so like, it's a three and a half hour class. So I have a break halfway through. I ran upstairs and asked one of the historians, I was like, hey, man, I don't, know this uh can you tell me what it is uh and so being able to i think one of the things that it makes teaching these classes the war and terror classes so hard is that there's just so much stuff coming from so many different directions that we have to be abreast of it all, at all times and sometimes i mean it's basically impossible sometimes and so being able to say like okay i don't know this exactly but i will get back to you and give you an answer about it and learning to and that showing that we can learn this these connections or these relationalities together um has been super fruitful because students are more willing to ask questions they're more um mine are so cur intellectually curious about it because they're like we hear all of this stuff all the time we don't know where this context come from can we learn it together so despite like talking about guantanamo all of last week that was the keyword we kept coming back to palestine right because that's the thing that is happening front and center that's eclipsing everything else, right? And so they're very curious about trying to make these connections. And if they can't see it, then they're willing and uh, excited to figure out what those connections actually are. Where do they come from? So y'all sounds like sound like good lit professors, by the way, just saying. I, I'm really enjoying this conversation of, you know, how do you incorporate lit and fiction into disciplines that, you know, quote unquote, traditionally don't incorporate this. But I think it goes back to this conversation that we, that you said you started off with and was picked up throughout was the fantasies that are constructed and what does using things that are quote fiction allow for students to kind of separate and start to really see the the connections and the the realities that are being drawn upon and how it kind of flips it when we come back to these these questions of history so hearing all this is is really fascinating and helpful for me as i think through what are the ways that you incorporate fiction like in an urban planning um conversation <laughs> Um, one of, so far we don't have any questions from YouTube yet, so I'm going to continue on with, with some threads. And if you all have topics that you really want to, um, pick up, up on, let me know. And when I'm happy to go the direction that you all are interested in, um, and, you know, we're, we started thinking through the stakes of our own classrooms and, you know, you bring this up in terms of well, what are the different students that we have in our classroom and I, and, you know, how does the world around us come back into our classroom? And I kind of want to uh, give a space to dig deeper into that of, you know, what are the ways in which you readjust your own teaching schedules to attend to, well, actually, this is the conversation here, the continuities that I need to bring into the classroom to speak to the current moment. Um, and how, how that has played out for you, especially in the last, you know, however many months, um, and what, what that means for your approach to teaching the global war on terror and recognize that they're often, given the structural nature of it, there are times where you, within, to, within your class, it feels as though there needs to be always an outlet, always a kind of off ramp to attend to the current moment, seeing how deeply imp like implicated the global war on terror is onto our everyday lives and institutions that we spend our everydays in. It's a very loaded question. I understand. I understand that. Yeah, well, I had a I had a thought, and I think it um, I, I think it's kind of pulling together a couple of, of of threads that we've been talking about here, and that is kind of for me. You know, I'm I'm um 
I'm teaching in a school of IR, but that's not necessarily where I was trained or, you know, where, where I've taught before. And so it's been interesting being in a space where race is ever present and it's not talked about at all. <laughs> right. And so kind of thinking about the fantasy, right. Like this, this, I mean, where it's almost kind of, it just feels like an alternate reality, right. Where like um, we're talking about, all of these conflicts that are happening in the world, but we don't historicize them properly to kind of like understand the, you know, why, where, what are the continuities? Um, and so in my class, like, you know, that's one of the, the kind of that shows up in every class, like somehow because it has to. Um, and uh, a student in um, a week ago sent kind of an email where she was talking about um, an international research class uh, that she's in and that um, she was wondering, she says like, I'm actually gonna read from it because I think it's interesting. She says, um, I'm an international studies major currently enrolled in an experiment, uh, international research class, and I hope to conduct my own IR theory building experiment. And so when reflecting on my time and, and doing this work, I, I realizing that I never saw any explicit mention of race and how it could affect the outcome of our projects. When focusing on places where race is a significant problem, there's almost no mention of it at all. And theory only revolves around these one dimensional ways of kind of covering the, the conflict. Um, and so she's thinking about what is, how does validity and generalize it generalizability kind of like, you know, is, is, is code for talking about racial politics, racial geopolitics, right? Um, and so I, I was thinking this, this kind of, as we're, you know, as I'm teaching about these continuities and students are able to make them, there's also this discomfort of what that, what the implication of that is, of realizing that, you know, there is, there are so many conversations happening where race is not being discussed. And again, like analytically for these students, like that, that inhibits their learning, right? Like that that inhibits their ability to kind of really access um, what they're looking at fully because they're only directed to like one kind of like, you know, side or one way of looking at it. And so um, I'm not sure there's, I mean, I have no neat conclusion, but like just kind of thinking again about like this idea of fantasy and then think, thinking about how, to, how teaching um, analytics that that highlight continuity um, can also cause this, this kind of, uh, you know, realization of what that means and then kind of what to do from there, um, I think is is also kind of, I'm, I'm curious um, what other people think about that. I only have the tiniest point because again, I'm not, I, I want to hear the answers, you know, I, I almost have a kind of like a, um, more just like a supplementary question <laughs> to Karim's question, but um yeah, I mean, would you, in terms of like an off ramp, uh, you know, like what was just discussed, or like an outlet um, to create space for something like what uh, Mariam was just describing, you know, that because you know students are asking, so you want to, you know, be, uh, you know, have your syllabus and stick to it, to, you know, to their, but at the same time, you know, have some flexibility. I don't know if I were teaching my class right now, I would probably scratch a reading and introduce. Thomas Friedman's latest column has like a primary source, uh, you know, uh, kind of in situ. So um, I don't know. Haven't you, have you done anything like that? Uh, yeah, I did it two weeks ago. So the buzzword of the day, the keyword of the day was Islamophobia. And I have, I'm pretty strict about my lesson plans just because I don't like to, it's just like how I am as a teacher. And I saw the New York Times and then the Wall Street Journal both had individual really fucked up Islamophobic uh, headlines. So one was about Dearborn and then the other one was about, oh, calling Palestinians animals. It was that was that one was from the New York Times. And so I used what Sarah, you just mentioned, like I used it as a primary source as a means of getting the discussion off the table. And I really was just like, no, we got to get back into our like the reading that I signed. I signed a whole book. You got to read it. Uh, but it ended up taking it like just those two article headlines ended up taking like 50 minutes of a three and a half hour class just because they all of a sudden were like, oh, okay, they, we've been talking about some of these ideas about Islamophobia. Here's how it works in this in the contemporary moment and how we could bring in Palestine. So all of a sudden, this kind of spontaneous example that I used just to start off discussion ended up taking most of the class, uh, a, a huge chunk of the class. And I'm, I'm pretty good with that. Like, I'm okay with that being like, we didn't talk about the last 30 pages of the book. It was fine. I don't think they minded either. 
Um, so just being able to go off the cuff like that and incorporate these primary sources as they happen in real time has been really fruitful because students perhaps have missed it or they're really interested in something that they saw over the weekend or whatever. So it's always very helpful. Um, somebody published a poem on Twitter and I was like, well, I could teach this next week, right? Like just being able to be flexible and capacious with my lesson plan has been in relation to, um, the, like teaching the war and terror as it's ongoing has been a pedagogical metamorphosis of sorts. So I'm usually, like I said, I'm usually really organized, but allowing myself to be a little capacious and like open-ended or open-minded about what I incorporate, when I incorporate, how I incorporate it has been really, really fruitful. And students end up being like, okay, yeah, that was a really interesting way to start the class off. And then I can make these larger connections. Yeah, very much. I think this conversation of immediately incorporating these as primary sources really mm -hmm. ingrains this continuity and this this is a present moment. It is not a moment of the foreclosed um, past, quote unquote. So I, I think that and framing it to, that way as students is is a really great way to reinforce these these lessons. Yeah. Yusuf. Yeah, I was also thinking about like part of um the question around like fantasy or or or, or like um, what f for me one of the things that I I try to invite students is to think against the world of practicalities and pragmatisms the world of legislative victories or of kind of these kinds of language that inhibit dreaming and inhibit kind of conjuring up old worlds and how they would look today. Uh, and I think, you know, so I start every class by saying that, like, that there is there is a clash, like, in addition to all of the kind of crises that we talk about, there's a real tension in the world between our lived realities and our dream world, the world that we want to see and the world as it, uh, the world that is pushed down on us, the world that says the thing that you you want to see is idealistic, is utopian, is otherworldly, it doesn't, you know, doesn't fly. And so I, I want to speak about that other world, the world of dreams that we had, dreams that were in, in the works of being implemented, that then were, were, were imprisoned, killed, assassinated, tortured, all of that. You know, like, what would it mean for the third world dreams? to have been implemented the only reason why they weren't able to, to see the, the 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 they weren't able to become reality wasn't because of the failure of those ideas but rather because of kind of the challenges that they faced from imperialism colonialism capitalism and all of the isms that we talked about and so that maybe like how do we excavate those dreams in order to find lessons for the present and so like, and, and so I kind of fly with that idea and I kind of go, I push it. So how do, how do we, how do I, um, I invite my students to try to be time travelers and teleporters. So how do you move between time, the past and the present? Because the, in, in a real way, the past is within you in the way that your parents raised you. So many of the students that I realized this today or in, in over the weekend, as I was thinking about this panel, I had this talk with um, Muslim students right after kind of the Israeli assault started and the amount of fear that I saw in them, the amount of trepidation about talking about what they think, who they are, really kind of took me back to my undergrad days, which was right during September 11th. And then I realized that the parents of these kids are my generation. I mean, like, you know, they're just like five years apart or something like that. So the parents that went through September 11th are now raising the kids that are going through this moment and both generations face the same kind of anti-Muslim racism in, in such a stark way. I could see it. And so the past, the past of September 11th is in these students because they were raised by those parents, by those parents' anxieties, by those parents' trepidations. And those parents were raised by the parents that went through the times of Nasser, Abdul Karim Qasim, and Nehru, and Tito, and all of that kind of third world imaginary. So that if you just simply are able to look within you, and ask those interrogative questions, you might be able to travel to a past 
without having to move at all within your seat. And then to really excavate the economy today and to see how things are made, how things are sold, distributed, produced, enables you to see that the whole, that the other, so China and folks working in China are part of your condition now in terms of the products, the phones, and the stuff you carry. So that you are able to travel across time, across space by really interrogating the thing right in front of you. So that requires a level of abstraction, so the fantastical maybe, but then it's a level of abstraction that enables that that starts from the concrete and is able to bring you back to the concrete conditions, as opposed to the fantasies, uh, the imperial fantasies, which are about a fantasy of an ossified world in which people's ontologies remain stagnant and static and always produce the same thing. It's an unchanging world. Ours is a dynamic world, is a constantly shifting world, a world in which we're able to travel back in time to find lessons for the present so that we could change the present, and a world in which we could travel across space so that we could see the commonalities in the other. And it's only by enabling ourselves to see the commonality in the other that you could actually tap into your own humanity, which is being constantly dehumanized by the state itself. It's the state that dehumanizes people as opposed to, you know, oh, I don't I don't know about the other. And thus, you know, uh, uh, if I, I need a teacher to dehumanize the other or to humanize the other so I could see that. No, you you are born by being able to see the human and the other. It is the state and the state logic that dehumanizes because it serves a geopolitical interest. So sorry, I don't know where I picked up, but that's kind of what I was thinking. No, that was great. I loved it. No, I, I think that very much this this element of kind of being able to stay in one place and still see all of these connectivities is is so important. And especially, you know, when you you realize the way in which students and their parents relate the different time periods in which and experiences they went through and how that has just been kind of a thread through throughout is just a very powerful space from which to start in in the classroom. Um, and I think maybe that that brings us to another question around, you know, what are the what are the methods and strategies that you've found have been helpful in kind of articulating these links between the students as that we all have in our classrooms today and the the past that they have seen with their you know, the, their peers around them, their their elders around them, whoever they may be. And is that something that you kind of intentionally try to incorporate in the classroom, especially given the kind of current moment of knowing, well, parents having felt the post 9-11 impacts and then students right now, as we watch a genocide unfold, um, you know, how do we, how do we really entangle that within our classrooms? Um, yeah. Maybe there isn't one very good way to do that, Grant. I mean, just to, while others are thinking, I can quickly say that something that I, I do um, think, you know, one of the kind of, uh, one of the assignments uh, in my class or that I've done that, to be honest, I'm, I actually still want to uh, tweak and um, do again, but better. But I have them do oral history interviews. So I have them speak to um, uh, to somebody in there. And I've... I, to date, I've kept it quite broad that it they simply have to speak to anybody who uh, was alive. <laughs> Excuse me, uh, you know, on 9-11. Um, and as I said, I, you know, that that's pretty much been the only criteria to this point, because the first time I ran the class, it was a bit of an experiment. And I was trying to see, you know, what would, you know, uh, what, you know, if I threw things against the wall, kind of like what would land. Um, but because, you know, I'm kind of um, like Yusuf in the sense that uh, it, my institution is very diverse. Uh, the student body is very diverse and they come from, you know, they're very, um, you know, uh, I'm lucky because my students like Yusuf's, I think, are very 
polyvalent in their subjectivities and their lived experience and the kind of multi-generational experience that informs their situatedness in the world. Um, so we're able to have, for the most part, uh, you know, conversations that can encompass all of these, you know, complexities. And, um, you know, I feel so inspired actually by everything that Yosef has just said. So I want to cut, I'm, I'm now I'm like really going to spend a lot of time thinking about how to like bring more of that in. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, to be honest, though, that's also been a bit of a mixed bag. I've gotten, uh, you know, students who've come back with these fascinating interviews of parents who, uh, you know, or aunts and uncles, you know, let's say who were in New York, you know, on the day of, and they recount their own experiences of like, you know, uh, grief, shock, mourning, also fetching all of the American flags that they could in the house so that they could put them as prominently as they could, you know, like on their persons and their businesses. And, um, you know, so, uh, um, you know, so that part, you know, that's been, I think, really enriching for a lot of students who've, uh, you know, been able to to do some of that uh, useful teleporting uh, that, you know, that Yusuf just described, but then, um, you know, I've also had students who've, you know, spoken to parents, uh, you know, who've come back in their interviews were just all about how, um, you know, uh, they don't think that the war on terror has, you know, closed borders enough, you know, things like that, right? Um, so I'm, I'm actually still really like working through that, to be honest, as a technique, uh, because uh, it's been uneven, let's say. Um. I mean, one of the ways that I do it is obviously through art, but, uh, and I'm the only person in the classroom who remembers 9-11. Um, so I don't have them do oral histories, but I think I like, I like that idea a lot because I think it would help mm -hmm. them kind of make connections that they previously um, hadn't thought of. But the way I do it is I teach um, secondary scholarship about um, say whatever those, but this is why the buzzword thing or the keywords thing is a good way to organize it. Cause then I can like, focus on one thing at a time and then we can kind of build outwards but like for the islamophobia stuff i taught um deepa kumar has a great interview it's a really long interview it's like 19 pages but it's totally worth it deepa kumar has a great interview with the jacobin i think and in it she goes through the, like a really succinct history of islamophobia in the nation and then she brings up like in passing two paintings that are from the napoleonic era and shows how Orientalism and Islamophobia worked way back then. And so I bring that up. I bring that, I pull up that actual painting and we talk, we unpack it. And I'm no art historian or critic of art, but um, we, ca we can look at these ideas or these theories of um, racialization and Orientalism that we've been talking about and apply to the, the to read the, to close read the painting. But then I bring that and I pair it to something much more contemporary and see what the resonances are. So for this semester, I can't remember the name of the Napoleon painting, but it's the Napoleon visits the um, the the um, the plague victims in Jaffa, uh, and or something like that. I, it's so it's a very long title. Anyway, uh, I pair that with this. I am um, the there's a really famous movie or like a series cover of Homeland that really racist show that came out a few years ago in the early aughts, right? Um, but in it, Claire Danes' character is like walking against a sea of women in um, hijabs and all of these different, like the whole perception. She's like looking back at the camera and she's like literally red, white, and blue. And so we talk about the difference between those two and see what the similarities about this painting that was painted in like 1813 and something that came out in their own lifetime in 2013 what is the difference between those two right what what connections can we make what are the similarities and how has that ideology continued into the present and in for the sake of the literature class how does that construct our understanding of art how does imperialism inform the art that we consume every day and the last example i use in this is the whitney houston um and i love whitney houston i have to say but the whitney houston american um oh my god i don't want to keep saying american theme song in my head um but the national anthem the performance she does in 1991 at the super bowl was deliberately done to get, garner support for the um desert storm and so we talk about the way that performance, the way it's sung, the reception of it, how all of that contributes to, and like that idea of compulsory patriotism 
contribute to imperial ideal, like the nation's imperial ideologies and imperial aims. Um, so I'm able to pull these random things that they have an idea of, but then, and like mash them together and put doing different genres really helps. Um, so yeah, that's just, there's one way I do that. I think you you all are speaking to like using the multiple anchor points, whether it be proximity by relationship through those oral histories or kind of these pop culture moments um, and facets that that draw them in. Um, I know this is a little bit of a jump from the conversation that we've been having, but I know based on our past conversations, there was an interest in talking about really situating our own classrooms and our institutions within the global war on terror and I, that came up through many conversations of, of your opening remarks and you know as we think about off ramps as we think about connections how do we bring in our own institutions into these conversations i mean we're, i'm sitting at columbia and the kind of current state of affairs here is one where you enter the classroom you're constantly thinking, well what is this classroom that i'm entering how do i teach urban planning given like the institution that I'm in and how can I always, for me, it's always, how can I bring this institution in into the conversation? And so I'm wondering how all have you thought about approaching it or have, you know, actively approached this or is this something that, you know, at the moment it's, it's not on the table um, as, cause for me, I think it, it very much speaks to our students of recognizing we need to read our, our own institutions and recognize that we're not just in a, a neutral space um, as we're learning about this topic. Again, very loaded questions I'm asking here. No, thank you so much for that question. It's, it's, I think it's something that, you know, all of us can kind of speak to the ways that we kind of approach this, but also I think the way that we are approached um, and I think like, you know, my experience um, prior to to where I am now at American University, I was at uh, Hamilton College, which, uh, you know, similar to kind of the liberal arts college environment. And it was a very strange experience because I came in, <clears throat> I came in very much thinking that, you know, I'm hired to teach about, you know, race, uh, language, identity. Um, and so that's that's what I was engaged in. Um, but but that college has a relationship to a right wing think tank that is connected to right wing media organizations like campus reform, et cetera. And I ended up kind of as I'm doing my work, I also became targeted for doing that particular kind of work. Right. That which I'm, I'm hired to do. Um, and throughout that process, I was there for five years. Um, it was it was very difficult to process that like, you know, on, on some level, I think, you know, I, I tried to cling to my analytics as a way of understanding what what's happening. Why me? How did I come into this kind of like trap, it seemed? Um, and so I think um, that's something that has shaped my thinking a lot. Uh, in the last few years and, and you know, now being um, in a very different institution, um, but nonetheless, you know, the way that uh, educational institutions as they become corporatized and have become increasingly kind of, you know, uh, privatized in terms of who is who's in charge um, and, and how are our policies kind of made or how are protect protections offered for students and faculty who are asking for that um, is it's very challenging because on the one hand, you know, you're, you can kind of see kind of what's happening in terms of an analysis of, of the power relations in that context and kind of, we can make those connections, I'm sure, at all of our universities. Um, but then on the other hand, it's kind of put, um, you know, uh, putting light onto that realization is not necessarily what kind of, uh, you know, creates more safety in any way, right? It actually can make it more difficult. Um, and I know that's one of the things that, you know, so many faculty are thinking about right now is how do we continue to engage in the work that we are um, very, you know, drawn and, and driven and motivated to do. But at the same time, this work has become politicized in a way that is not just about, you know, the fact that all uh, education is political, but actually kind of has created 
degrees of unsafety um, for faculty and students um, and for for others, right? Because because this is being pulled as a particular kind of crisis um, and and deliberately being kind of produced in that way. And so, how do we kind of draw attention to that? I mean, um, I think one of the ways is I think pointing out some of the new policies and statements um, that are happening on campus and like what we were just saying, using that as primary material um, and kind of, you know, thinking about this is an, another example of, you know, intercultural discourse on a college campus. How do we kind of analyze it? Um, what is being centered? What is not? All of that kind of thing. But I think, um, yeah, just it's 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 kind of um, morphing and changing and, you know, it's hard to kind of like gauge how to approach it. Um, but at the same time, I think talking openly about that is is key. Like that's the other part is like, you know, sharing um, and and discussing kind of our challenges and, and our strategies, um, even if the strategy is very much emergent um, and we're still kind of figuring out how, how we're going to approach this moment. Can I jump in real quick and say, um, you know, one, I, I really am grateful to you, Miriam, for the stances that you took when all of this was happening to you at Hamilton. And honestly, for me, I felt so bad for so long because it was happening during the pandemic. And I felt like I didn't do enough uh, to support you. And I feel like a lot of people face, um, you know, we get we get isolated and 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 people get attacked and all of that and and the courage that you showed in in kind of doing exactly what you said which is i'm going to be public about it i'm going to say it exactly as it is and taking the courageous act of leaving that institution and we all know what the academic job market is so i just want to kind of put out there how appreciative i am of kind of what you did at the time and 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 so i, I I say that too, and I, I feel like part of the problem with the university is that there's two places at the same time. I feel like I'm saying this about everything, but like there is the university as the way that Sarah uh, talked about the article that you that you all are writing, which sounds really exciting as as itself the side of knowledge production within the context of like hegemonic power in the Gramscian sense, so that the university, at least at the top level, is a space to produce the intellectual, cultural, and historical basis for consent for power itself, which then means that classrooms um, could become that space of like a, kind of a, a response or an attack. But then at the same time, the other issue, wh why the university becomes a dear place, maybe in all of our hearts, is that there's the university we want, need, and demand uh, uh, and which you could find in a lot of our classrooms, uh, because we control them, then they became, they become a space for a more utopian university where we try to slow down, uh, uh, which I think is really important when you're teaching students of color, because, uh, the, one of the inequalities that exist in the United States is between who has the right to be slow and who has the, who has to just keep running fast so students of color need to finish fast they don't have job they don't have a time to read they don't have a time to take you know double major they need to leave so they could get a job whereas the 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 their upper their their wealthy counterparts you know get to you know relax and have a liberal arts education in which they think about themselves and their space within the universe like that doesn't have so how, then creating that that space within our classrooms uh, uh, to study together, to put together our political imaginaries in order to kind of conceive of different worlds. So I feel like that those both of those places uh, happen at the same time, which we so which is why we keep putting ourselves in a position that then also opens us up to kind of retribution and this force that I think like Miriam, you talked about. So for me, what I take solace in, like I, I teach political, you know, my supposedly my expertise is on the Middle East and North Africa. But I, for a longest time, I was so scared about talking pal about Palestine and Israel. So I would talk about the concepts and I would, but rather than to kind of focus in on that, because I didn't know who the students were that would then, you know, report to conservative newspapers. I had a student who was a journalist for a conservative newspaper where she was paid to kind of put out these kind of stories. Like you just don't know those things. But, and so I think it does take a level of courage and I'm trying to learn to have that courage 
to so for example for me how do i reconceptualize my class to teach to teach the entire history of the world through teaching israel and palestine so that i teach how do i teach israel and palestine as a way to talk about the, the progression of the development of capitalism, colonialism, imperialism through the understanding of Israel and Palestine. So I, I don't know. I feel like, you know, for I take solace in that the the way that we get attacked means that our teaching is important, that that to take teaching kind of seriously, that our classrooms are important, that 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 uh, and, and and like, you know, not all of us as academics are activists. We definitely are an organizers. You could tell when we set up meetings, nobody knows how to run a meeting. But we're all teachers, and teaching then matters. Uh, and and so and, and secondly, how do I invest in the university as a public space that is meant to serve the publics as opposed to states? And how do I kind of push for proclaiming our independence as scholars? And all of my students are scholars from the state and the state logic. Uh, and I think that in in uh, um, in in order to kind of bring upon these kinds of other ways of imagining, um, and yeah, so I'll stop there. Yeah, I just all I want to say really is just um, I, you know, so well put. I just like so perfectly. I encapsulates. I mean, there's very much this. You know, when you talk about like, these two two places, these two universities, Yusuf, it just makes me think about, um, you know, what that creates for us is this kind of dissonance. And so the university now is is very much this place of dissonance. And I think if you're teaching the global war on terror, if, if you, you know, if that's your subject matter uh, in the classroom, then your classroom becomes like such a microcosm, such a concentrated space where that dissonance gets played out. And your classroom is at one and the exact same time, both this, you know, uh, utopian, uh, you know, um, liberatory, you know, project that we're all obviously suckers for and why we're here and like trying to work towards that. And, um, potentially more so than any other classroom, you know, on campus at that exact moment. Also, you know, very much the the most kind of, um, you know, in the, uh, uh, um, you know, targeted space for at the same time that punitive, uh, you know, and panoptic, uh, you know, project on campuses. Um, and, you know, uh, I have, you know, at the, at, again, at one and the same time, I've got like the same students that you're describing who, uh, you know, and as as you've, uh, you know, articulated so beautifully, uh, you know, that you're trying to like take that time for who they don't have. I mean, my students are taking uh, five and six classes, you know, at one time. I mean, they're trying to finish four year degrees in, in two and a half, three years. Right. Uh, <laughs> so um, so, you know, trying to is carve that out, especially in a first year seminar. That's the whole point of the first year seminar. Um, that's, you know, really something that's uh, considered in and of itself, like a kind of elite, you know, format that, you know, the students at my institution, you know, don't often, don't often get, uh, to get that kind of like, a, you know, in a small space, uh, you know, having this like one-on-one -on -one interaction with the professor every day, right. Um, or every week, not every day. but, um, you know, but at the same time, being keenly aware that, you know, uh, certainly there are students who, um, uh, you know, are, uh, have been incorporated into that kind of like informant, uh, you know, economy. Uh, and um, uh, so that, you know, that feeling of being, of being watched as it were, uh, you know, that kind of seeing yourself through, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the, um, the prism of, you know, exactly the the mechanisms that are uh, designed to kind of, it's, it's precisely what panopticism is, you know, like you're kind of that self-consciousness of, you know, uh, that's, that's neutralizing uh, and silencing. So those, those things going on, you know, through every beat, you know, of a, of a, of a how a class like unfolds, you know, is really, you know, um, can be unnerving. And it is, you know, I think precisely that kind of, um, you know, two things like courage, but, uh, but that's not, you know, not reducible to just kind of like individual, uh, um, you know, 
character. It's <laughs> it really has to come from this kind of collective place, right? Uh, and drawing strength, you know, from the the fact that we're obviously um, not alone <laughs> in this work. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, there's, it's, it really truly is kind of the holding that dissonance of the, the two university, two worlds that we, we walk through and kind of are, are teaching through um, and finding, finding the, the ways to critically bring, bring them together. I think it's just, you know, it's a challenge, but it's also like a very, in some ways it, it's a, a really good starting point. I keep, I feel like I keep reiterating that point of like finding those, those I don't want to say clashes, but intersections and and kind of breaking them apart um, as, a, as a, a great way. Um, I know we're about at time and I want to respect everyone's time. We're all very, very busy. So I, I want to open up. Are there any last kind of closing words and thoughts that you all want to make about both, you know, teaching the global war on terror, you know, how, how you've, you've found this discussion in terms of making steps forward and I think that one of the strengths of this so far has been really rooting ourselves in practices and we've I felt like I've, I've come out of this with like oh here's great approaches and kind of pathways that um I can bring to my classroom so I really appreciate that um but any final thoughts or comments before we close out yeah Jay yeah really quick I just wanted to say thank you and to Sarah in particular for kind of bringing us together multiple times now and allowing for these conversations to have space to not just like be had, but to breathe and allowing it to be rooted in a practicality. Right. So we always often talked about like, Oh, this is what happens in the classroom, but like really giving concrete examples fundamentally helps me shape my own pedagogy and like the way I bring it into the classroom. So giving our, giving us this space, I really appreciate, um, even, um, M E S P I. I don't know if y'all call it mess by, but um, but <laughs> giving us a space to talk about it is really really helpful. And just um, I think we need more of it throughout the throughout academia. So thank you. Yeah, I'd like to echo Jay. Um, also, thank you so much to Sarah, uh, to Makaram for organizing us. <clears throat> and I'm just kind of like um, really thinking about a lot of like phrases that are going to like stick with me especially thinking about the informant economy I feel like that's an article that needs to be written um, especially in this moment right I mean that and also that the resonance of thinking about you know the dissonance of of, of being in two worlds right now right as soon as um, um, you know constantly being engaged in kind of social media kind of like uh, you know reading of what's happening in the world and then also living in a world that seems to be completely disconnected from that and so I think that kind of mirrors for me like this conversation about pedagogy where which we have all the time but we don't necessarily have it in this way with, through this kind of like frame um, and so I, I really appreciate that because I think um, it's helped me actually just articulate for myself kind of you know some of the the um, intuitive kind of like moves that I'm doing but actually are are very much kind of in, in in this collective uh, conversation about how do we teach about um, the war on terror, particularly at this moment and moving forward as we kind of are going to continue to see, uh, you know, more more um, terrorism kind of happening across the world um, by empire. So we need to kind of like, I think, think through that. Yeah. I also want to thank to uh, uh... Sarah and Mikaram for doing this and for including me in the conversation. This is this is so incredible for me personally. So I'm I'm deeply grateful. And and I also just you know seeing kind of what's happening in the world, I feel like um I'm trying to find the courage uh and also the intellectual capacity to learn so that I could teach the in a way to question the very legitimacy of the united states the legitimacy of the west the legitimacy of all of this thing that is called the international through the through the way in which the white house and number 10 downing street talks about and to question the very legitimacy of liberalism and the ways that things have been set up so because i think the actual world is telling on itself 
like the 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 world that that the way that that um the US the western europe is talking about palestine as opposed to the way that it's talking about ukraine and russia the way that it operated in the the what the war on terror did i mean it killed something just in iraq so i in iraq the numbers are between 100,000 to 1.5 million which is a ridiculous um degree like it doesn't make any sense but the reason why it's a ridiculous degree and nobody knows is because people's lives don't matter the blood of certain people isn't worth the same as the blood of other people uh and the fact that nobody within the west nobody within the united states has to has ever taken uh uh, uh been said that they're culpable for it or in somehow showed any remorse or somehow said hey, maybe we need to think about it differently. And in then all of our disciplines, there is never a question about, hey, maybe we're wrong about all of this NGO business that we talk about as if somehow there's salvation to the world. Maybe we're wrong about these quick fixes to development issues. Maybe we're wrong about like development studies itself. But nowhere have I seen anybody in these disciplines interrogate themselves. 20 years on from catastrophes. I mean, people in Iraq are going to suffer for the next 50 years because of what the United States did. People in Afghanistan are going to suffer for generations. And the same thing in Palestine. And not a word, not a word. And so for me, I'm like, I'm trying to challenge myself through the imposter syndrome that I live through and the anxieties that I live through. How do I teach myself so that I could show that, that these places are not legitimate? That the very because they constant are so, the sovereignty of all of those places is always conditional. The sovereignty of colonized spaces is always questioned, but not the sovereignty of these places. So how do we make the United States sovereignty conditional, just like the sovereignty of all peoples all across the world? I, I feel like you know the reality is telling on them. So why how how do I how do I bring that into the classroom? And that takes a lot of work. And I'm, this, I aspire to it. I'm not, you know, if you talk to my student, they'll probably be like, dude, this guy, all, all he does is talk all the time. I'm not sure he's the most innovative teacher, but that's, that's the project. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm kind of done trying to like, oh, let me teach you about Iraq. It ain't about Iraq. It's about here. And if you want to learn about Iraq, learn about what's going on here. Um, sorry, I, I kind of got that. No, thank you. This is, you know, there's a lot of kind of fruit for thought left lingering. And so I really want to thank all of you for taking the time and preparing um, these remarks. Um, I hope that this is not the end of the conversation. I know that the Middle East Studies Pedagogy Initiative, which I'm the managing editor, is very interested in continuing these conversations, especially as world living in a very dynamic world um so again thank you all um and i hope to stay connected and i really appreciate all of this all right have a good rest of your day everyone thank you thanks okay. everybody bye